Excellent. Thank you uh, so much for the uh, kind introduction, Martin. And um, it's been, yeah, just kind of reflecting on w when this all began and how far we've come. I'm very excited to see. Um, I'm very proud of how far we've come and, and what we've accomplished to date uh, at the Stone Center, um, both clinical and trans uh, translational research. And um, I'm excited of, of many more exciting things to come. So today I'll, I'll tell you all a little bit about um, what we've been working on in terms of the role of the intestinal microbiome um, and associated metabolites in, in, in kidney stone disease. And I mean, I'm, we've all heard about the microbiome by now, I'm sure. And um, basically, the human body harbors about 10 times more microbial cells than human cells, which basically means that technically we're only 10% human. Um, and uh, considering you know, there's there's up to 1,800 genera and 36,000 bacterial species. That basically means these are about 100 trillion friends you didn't actually know you had. And the human genome is roughly uh, contains 30,000 protein coding genes. And in comparison, uh, the bacterial genome contains 3 million protein coding genes. So when you look at that, so on that basis, we're about um, only 99%. Um, uh, we're actually 99% uh, um, bacterial. Um, and considering um, the significance of, of all of this, the, the intestinal microbiome is actually considered to be an organ, a fun fully functional organ in and of, of itself. And so one of the most important roles of the gut microbiome is that it basically enhances our metabolism. Um, because as I mentioned already, the number of genes in the gut microbiome vastly exceeds that of the human genome and essentially um uh it, it encodes biochemical pathways or, or proteins involved in, in biochemical pathways that humans have not involved and so it is a very uh, close symbiotic relationship between uh, human and the the bacteria um within the gut microbiome um and it's very important in maintaining uh, overall health so what's its its function well it's actually responsible for breaking down complex carbohydrates, such as starches, non-starch polysaccharides and proteins that we, like I mentioned, can't actually, we don't have the capacity to break down. So essentially what happens is the, the monosac monosaccharide polysaccharides, you know, get extracted from, from the food. Um, some of them are absorbed in the proximal small intestine where there's not much bacterial colonization. Now, the ones that we can't digest move on to the distal small intestine, the ileum, as well as the, the colon, which considers, contains significantly greater numbers of, of, of bacteria. And this is where the bacterial digestion of these polysaccharides occurs and bacterial fermentation happens to produce mainly short-chain fatty acids, which are butyrate, acetate, propionate, and lactate that then get absorbed relatively quickly. And they perform numerous functions uh, including lowering the luminal pH uh, of the uh, intestinal tract, increasing bacterial biomass, as well as uh, epithelial barrier health, uh, um, just to mention a few. But what about the maintenance of overall human health? Well, um, metabolites produced by the intestinal microbiome are actually involved in the regulation of, of key immune responses throughout the body, they prevent overgrowth of, of pathogens. An example, of course, is, is the whole idea of when uh, C. difficile infection, when C. difficile takes over, when the um, intestinal microbiome is, is uh, compromised by uh, antibiotic treatment. Um, they regulate cell proliferation and vascularization of the host. It uh, regulates endocrine functions of the intestine as well as regulation of energy. Um, as well as regulating the overall metabolism of the host. So it's not surprising that disruption, or also known as dysbiosis, is associated um, with disease. And so just to go over a few examples, irritable bowel disease. Um, in irritable bowel disease, there's significant per perturbations in the gastrointestinal microbiota uh, in these patients. Mainly what you see here in the IBD subset is you see a significant reduction in bacteroides and uh, lactobacillaceae, um, which basically means that, that there's an underrepresentation of bacterial species that produce one of the main short-chain fatty acids, which is butyrate. And butyrate is important 
um, because it's a main energy source for colonocytes um, and essentially is also involved in the maintenance uh, um, of, of tight junctions and essentially promotes barrier function. So, of course, if you have less butyrate as a result of this perturbation in, in the microbiome composition, uh, that results in a more leaky gut, which uh, in, in turn, of course, uh, results in, in, in the um, IBD. Another one uh, is obesity. And so um, the very first study that really uh, pointed this out was, was uh, performed by Turnbull et al. back in 2006, where basically they worked with leptin-deficient mice, and these are essentially uh, obese mice, and basically found that um, when you looked at the uh, uh, stool um, from these animals, that the obese mouse cecum had a significantly increased concentration of acetate and butyrate um, compared to that of, of, of lean animals. In addition, they found uh, that this resulted in enrichment in genes involved in energy extraction from food uh, and essentially found that there was less energy uh, overall left in the stool of, of obese animals, meaning that more energy and calories were extracted, um, um, pr promoting the obese state. Now, when the bacterial load from obese mice was given uh, to germ-free wild-type recipients, they gained weight, a significant amount of weight compared to uh, those mice that received uh, a, a wild type or, or a normal, sorry, a lean um, bacterial load or bacterial load from meat, lean animals. Um, the weight increased significantly over two-week periods, and this was despite the same amount of food being consumed by the animals. So this quite strikingly shows how the significant role that the mere microbiome composition can have on a disease state such as obesity. Now, what about humans? So the human gut predominantly consists of bacteroides and firmicute um, bacteria or, or bacteria from these groups. And essentially what, what this study did by, by Lee et al. in 2006, same, same time as the Turnbaugh study in, 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 in rats, um, they basically took obese individuals, placed them on either a calorie or fat-restricted diet, and essentially showed that as the diet, uh, the, the duration of the diet proceeded, um, the number of firmicutes decreased while the number of bacterioides increased. And this is very similar to what you would see in an, um, a lean individual. Uh, in addition, um, uh, what was also interesting is that again, the change in bacterioides abundance increased significantly with decreased body weight in both um, the carbohydrate and, and restricted uh, uh, fat restricted diets. So basically what this study shows is that the microbial community in the gut actually affects the amount of energy extracted uh, from the diet, much like it did in the animals. Now this is a local effect within, these are local effects within the, within the intestinal tracts. What about distance effects? And there, there are very distant effects that the uh, intestinal microbiome has. And basically there's such a thing as the gut brain kidney access. So basically the gut mucosa, of course, uh, contains the um, um, microbiome and that's separated from the submucosa by the epithelia uh, barrier. Um, now, immune cells within the lymph nodes monitor intestin the intestinal environment and maintain gut homeostasis. Uh, in addition, you, you have the enteric uh, nervous system, which consists of several nerve plexuses. And these essentially sense chemical and mechanical changes um, within the gut uh, mucosa and the gut environment, um, and basically then begins to communicate with the autonomic nervous system. Um, and as a result, in, in combination, what will then happen uh, is that whatever changes are induced within the gut by changes in the intestinal microbiome composition, because again, you can remember that these bacteria will interact with these epithelial cells and trigger um, um, different, um, sorry, different uh, um, um, signaling. Um, these then enter into circulation, and once in the circulation, they can, of course, have, have systemic effects. So what about stone disease? Well, there is intestinal dysbiosis 
uh, associate with stone disease. So urinary oxalate, as I'm sure everybody's aware, contributes to 70 to 80 percent of kidney stones. And there's two sources of this. There's the the exogenous, which is the dietary source, where of course uh, oxalate from food is absorbed um, into circulation across the intestinal epithelial barrier. Um, and of course, then there's the endogenous route, which is production from uh, glyoxalate uh, in, in the liver. Now, oxalate metabolizing bacterial species um, are speculated to maintain overall oxalate homeostasis. And there's two different types that exist. There's the facultative oxalate consumers, as well as the obligate oxalate consumers. And so what does this mean? Well, so the facultative species are those that are capable of degrading oxalate. So they can do it, but they don't readily do it. And there's this whole number that we find uh, on that list. And these are just a few. And of course we find the usual suspects that we know as the usual probiotic species like Bactobacillus, Lactobacillus or Bifidobacterium. Then there are the obligate species. And really there's only one obligate bacterial species that, that um, uh, exclusively degrades oxalate and that's oxalobacter formigenes. And when, when this was discovered in the, in the rumen of cows, actually um, um, a few years back, you know, everybody thought we'd found the answer to what causes kidney stone disease, which was a lack of colonization with oxalobacter formigenes. And so several studies began to arise where people started looking at the presence and absence of, of oxalobacter in the intestine of patients versus healthy individuals uh, to try and figure out if this does uh, differentiate uh, the, the stone status. And overall, as is usually the case um, with, with these types of studies, uh, the um, uh, results were variable. For example, the range of colonization uh, in healthy individuals was anywhere between 11 to 100%, whereas colonization of the, the gut by in kidney stone formers was found anywhere be to be anywhere between 0% to 100%. So it's not quite um, uh, um, as, as clear cut as one would have thought or would have hoped. So what happens if we supplement um, either oxalobacter formigenes or lactic acid, bacteria, uh, lactic acid bacteria mix? And again, several studies have been conducted along these lines in both humans and animals. And what you'll find is that the duration of treatment varies significantly, as does the impact on urinary oxalate uh, levels um, and, and the persistence uh, of how long this effect stays around. And so um, overall, the consensus seems to be that studies using ophromigenes or even lactic acid bacteria supplementation is successful. However, the colonization is... is uh, uh, only very temporal and, and bacteria become undetectable quite quickly after the administration ceases. So the overall conclusion from these studies is basically that while oxalobacter formigenes is important, it is certainly not necessary or sufficient for oxalate homeostasis. And it kind of makes sense because, um, again, Oxalobacter is one bacterial species in 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 uh, uh, you know a mix of of thousands of, of species, and so having that one not present or present uh, shouldn't make a, a significant difference in terms of the overall oxalate uh, homeostasis. And so, uh, a case was being made for there being a multi-species rule. And why is this? Well, again, individuals without alphamigenes don't form stones. Individuals with ophromigenes still form stones. Um, um, again, the presence of oxalobacter formigenes was only associated with lower urinary oxalate levels in, in about 55% of individuals. The intestinal microbiome is highly symbiotic. Um, and of course, there's the additional bacterial species capable of degrading oxalates. So studies started to look beyond oxalobacter formigenes. And so here's one of the first studies by um, Tiganese and et al. Um, in, in 2018, where they basically looked at um, stone formers and healthy controls. And uh, stone formers were had, found to have uh, greater calcium excretion as well as greater oxalate excretion. And of course, as a result, 
um, a greater uh, supersaturation for calcium oxalate. When you looked at the intestinal microbiome of these individuals, uh, the overall alpha diversity, which is basically the diversity in bacterial species between samples within a group, was found to be lower in stone formers compared to um, um, healthy uh, individuals. Um, interestingly enough, when they looked at Oxalobacter formigenes, it was detected in all participants at very low representation, about less than 0.001% of the entire microbiome uh, composition. Um, but again, the point is that it was found in every single participant, so in both stone formers as well as healthy controls. And so when, when looking at, at 24 hour urinary oxalate excretion um, uh, and the uh, abundance of oxalate degrading genes, so basically what they did was they looked at the genes that, that uh, uh, are involved in degrading oxalate. They basically found that uh, as the urinary oxalate excretion decreased, so did the number uh, of genes um, uh, capable of degrading oxalate. Um, and when you look at the actual oxalate degrading taxa, so the actual bacterial taxa, the same trend was found that as the urinary oxalate excretion decreased, um, um, so did the uh, relative abundance of these, these, these bugs. Um, and so the fact that none of the known taxa with oxalate degrading properties were significantly different between these groups as well as the fact that, of course, every single one of them had oxalobacter formigenes significantly suggested that other bugs play a role. And um, so we turn to in vivo models to try and get a better idea of this. And so uh, a very good friend and collaborator, Aaron Miller, from who is now at Cleveland Clinic, um, studied this in, in, in wood rats in the Utah desert. Why wood rats? Well, it's because they naturally consume high oxalate diets in the wild up to 1.5%. And this is basically, uh, these, these rats harbor a consortium of, of oxalate degrading bacteria that are actually capable of handling dietary oxalate as high as 9% of the diet in terms of the dry weight. This is very unique. Um, to to this back to, uh, to these uh, these wood rats and as a result they make an excellent study system to better understand the gut microbiome and oxalate interactions and what species may be uh, key for this and so in this particular study they quantified the maximum tolerable oxalate dose overall by these rats essentially before they died um, they looked at the changes in the gut microbiota diversity as they changed the amount of oxalate in the diets. And of course, then went on to identify species that exhibit uh, significant change uh, in abundance with the consumption. Essentially, what they found that all of the oxalate, so this is how efficient this microbiome is at degrading oxalate, all of the oxalate that is actually consumed over the, 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 the day is essentially degraded. Um, the amount of oxalate that is degraded increased with the dietary content of the oxalate, and they went up as high as 12% and then took some of these animals on the 12% diet and decreased them back down to 6% to truly be able to study the changes in the microbiome composition as you ramp up oxalate concentration exposure and then decrease it back down again. When you look at the community diversity within the microbiome of these animals, again, diversity increased up to 6% of um, um, dietary oxalate content, and then began to decrease as you went beyond that. And, and this is ex likely the result of an interesting phenomenon where um, while some of these bacteria are very efficient at degrading oxalate, they're also at the same time very sensitive to uh, very high concentrations of oxalate. And so if the oxalate levels get too high, it actually becomes lethal to these species. And so overall, what they found was that there were about 101 taxa that changed with the oxalate consumption. And um, they termed this essentially the oxalate metabolic bacterial network. And here are just uh, uh, very f a few of them that exhibit the most significant uh, uh, differences. So the question became, okay, so now that this, this, this oxalate metabolic network exists in these rats, does it also potentially exist in humans? And so we performed a study here in Vancouver where we 
compared the intestinal microbiome composition of 17 recurrent stone formers and 17 known stone forming controls. Um, and, and overall essentially looked at their uh, nutrient and dietary parameters and noted that there were no difference says in terms of uh, these uh, between uh, the patients and controls. And when we looked at the, the gut microbiome, we essentially found that there was a reduction in, in the tenere acute phylum in patients. There was also a sex-specific sex significant difference in, in, in the abundance, but not the presence or absence of specific bacterial species. And this may very well reflect differences in, in, in the incidence of stone disease between males and females. Now, when we looked at the differential abundance analysis, and this is at the, the, the uh, um, um, bacterial level, 63 bacterial species were essentially enriched in patients, while 103 were enriched in controls. Interestingly enough, oxalobacter formigenes was not abundant uh, in controls. And so while there was certainly a trend towards a higher abundance of oxalobacter um, uh, uh, between the groups, um, this uh, there was certainly no statistical significance, however. Now, what we did find that there was a greater number of co-occurrence interactions in controls, which basically means that certain bacterial species co-occurred with oxalobacter. So basically when oxalobacter was there, so were these other species. And if oxalobacter wasn't there, these species were also gone. And we actually found, which was very interesting, that the, 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 the uh, co-occurrence interactions was actually a greater predictor of stone recurrence or stone status than the presence or absence of oxalobacter uh, alone. So that was an interesting finding. Now, what about the robustness of this oxalate metabolizing microbial network that I was talking about? And so this is where we compared the findings from the rats to the humans. And we found that certainly some overlap existed. And taxa such as Ruminococcus and Ocellospira uh, were present in stone formers um, uh, and associated with the presence of oxalobacter. Formigenes were also stimulated by oxalate um, in, in the rats. Um, so essentially what we found in this study when, then was that an oxalate degrading microbial network did exist uh, in humans as well, which was very exciting. So to summarize then, what do we know so far? Well, again, oxalate comes from the diet. It's, it's uh, uh, broken down in the microbiome or by the microbiome by key players like oxalobacter formigenes, as well as other members of this key uh, bacterial network. And this, of course, reduces uh, oxalate absorption um, into circulation. But what does this all mean? So really, all we know now is what's there and what isn't there. But realistically, honestly, who cares? Because what we really need to know is what does that mean functionally? So we need to look at the metabolic capabilities of the microbiome as a whole and try and understand what is different about these metabolic capabilities in, in, in patients uh, and, and controls. And so we perform deeper sequencing. So this is shotgun metagenomic sequencing, which basically um, um, uh, sequences the, the microbiome, of each individual bacterium within that sample. And then that allows you to look down uh, at the, at the gene level. And so basically what we found was um, differences in, in some key metabolic pathways that distinguish patients from controls. And the top three basically uh, were in antimicrobial drug resistance, which actually makes sense because there has been previous findings that uh, increased antibiotic use also increases stone recurrence. The uh, next was xenobiotic degradation of metabolism. And the last was glycan biosynthesis and metabolism, which was of course very convenient um, because uh, and we decided to focus on glycan biosynthesis because this is most closely associated to um, kidney stone disease. So we basically looked at oxalate metabolism as a control and then also focused on glyoxalate metabolism because that's responsible for endogenous uh, oxalate production 
Ascorbic metabolism, um, um, because there is a link between um, ascorbate and uh, 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 kidney stone disease. And we also focused on butyrate metabolism because we knew, of course, that butyrate plays a significant role in, in intestinal membrane integrity and, and barrier function, which, of course, is a determinant of the absorption of any compound um, into circulation within the intestine. So when we perform differential abundance analysis, which basically looks at the differences in the genes that are present or absent, we essentially found that there were 114 genes more abundant in healthy controls, while 23 were abundant, uh, more abundant in the patient population. So when we looked at the oxalate metabolism genes, and they're all listed here, we didn't actually find any significant difference in the abundance of these um, between the patients and, 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 and controls, which basically means that there was no overall difference in the ability to break down oxalate. What about glyoxalate, ascorbic acid, and the butyrate metabolism? Again, we found no significant difference in the abundance of these pathways between stone formers and non-stone forming controls. Now, what about the completeness of these, these pathways? Well, again, no significant difference in the completeness of each of these metabolic pathways um, were found again between patients and controls. So at this point, we were getting sort of, I don't want to say depressed, but kind of less enthusiastic about all of this because we weren't really getting much of a difference until we actually looked at specific genes. And what we found specifically for the butyrate metabolic pathway was that there was a lower abundance of um, four key key genes um, uh, involved in the um, uh, metabolism and production of butyrate within the gut. So this basically suggested that the capacity to produce butyrate is decreased within the patient microbiome. And so, again, this is very, very exciting because nobody had reported this previously uh, in, in connection with, with kidney stone disease. So we had a potential compound other than oxalate that might play a significant role. What was even more exciting, and talk about a coincidence, is that a very good friend and colleague of ours, uh, Greg Tajian, who's a uh, pediatric uh, urologist uh, at, at CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia was performing the very a very similar study um, comparing intestinal microbiome uh, composition in forty four patients aged four to eighteen, um, and and essentially we happened to meet uh, um, randomly um, in the in the airline lounge at the airport at the end of one of the the main conferences. Uh, the book Congress of End Urology, and we just kind of started catching up. And he was telling me about these exciting differences that he found in the capacity for for butyrate production um, in in patients versus controls. And so I went and I asked him. I said, "Well, which specific um, uh, uh, genes did you find to be less abundant?" And it turns out butyryl CoA dehydrogenase was one of them, which incidentally was also one of the ones that we found. So. Again, this was very, very exciting because now we were able to 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 um, show that um, there seems to be very similar uh, uh, mechanisms in both the uh, children and and um, uh, uh, population as well as uh, adults. So, what is it about butyrate? Uh, in oxalate absorption. What's the effect? Well, basically, butyrate promotes, again, intestinal uh, health by regulating epithelial tight junction and barrier function. And again, as I mentioned, that is a main determinant of oxalate absorption. It actually upregulates the expression of key transporters known to be involved in oxalate uh, absorption and secretion in the gut. Um, and as a result, the decreased butyrate production uh, by in the patient microbiome may result in increased oxalate absorption due to more permeable intestinal epithelium, as well as changes in, in, in transport expression. In addition, talk about distant effects. Butyrate has also been found to reduce reactive oxygen species production, as well as to regulate immune cell activity and cytokine production within the kidneys, where butyrate supplementation has been found to reduce chronic kidney injury in several animal models. So all of these point for a potential role in butyrate uh, um, in 
potentially oxalate absorption as well as uh, kidney stone disease. So this now resulted in us turning again back to animal models and basically being interested in how butyrate supplementation could potentially reduce uh, hyperoxaluria when using it in, in a diet-induced mouse model. And so for this, we developed a diet-induced mouse model for hyperoxaluria, um, where essentially we, we provide um, uh, high oxalate diets uh, that then results in hyperoxaluria and then assessed the butyrate supplementation. Now we, we chose two routes. One is by, by supplementing tributyrin. Why tributyrin? Well, it's because tributyrin is broken down into three butyrate uh, uh, um, molecules, if you will, uh, by the intestinal microbiome. And we also gave inulin, which is a prebiotic that basically increases the butyrate, the number of or amount of butyrate producers. So the first study was to essentially take the animals, they're climatized um, uh, for an amount of time where they're actually all co-housed because mice like to eat each other's feces. So we needed to make sure that they're all kind of exposed to each other so that we kind of start to normalize the microbiome composition from the beginning. And then animals were um, um, divided into different groups where they either stayed on the control diet, they were either given an inulin diet or a tributyrin diet, as well as a high oxalate diet. Because again, this part of the project was to basically establish this high oxalate uh, 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 hyperoxaluria uh, model. So when you looked at the microbiome composition in the stool, we basically found that the alpha diversity, which again is within groups, is significantly reduced in the case of inulin uh, supplementation. It is reduced compared to the control animals when on the high oxalate diet. And when supplementing tributyrin, it is also reduced to a significant level to oxalate. And a uh, similar trend was found, well, an opposite trend was found with beta diversity, where actually the beta diversity, which again is the differences between the different groups, um, uh, the beta diversity was increased um, on the inulin diet. Um, and the same trends were also found in the cecum. Now, why do we differentiate between stool and cecum? Well, it's because butyrate production mostly happens in the cecum, while stool, of course, is, is a mix uh, from the entire length of the intestine tract. So when looking further at the actual cecal diversity, and, and uh, we, we basically found um, that uh, um, the diversity uh, was um, a greater um, on the inulin diet and found that lacnospiraceae as well as clostridia were higher um, or, or there were greater amounts of them um, in animals that were supplemented with, on the inulin diet which are actually known short chain fatty acid producers. So this basically indicated that the diets did have the effect that we wanted it to ha uh, have. When looking at urinary oxalate before and after, meaning um, um, on the when the before all animals were on the control diet and the after was after the other diet was induced, you can see that um, when you uh, uh, put the animals on the high oxalate diet, the urinary oxalate also increases. Interestingly, on the in, inulin diet, um, the the uh, amount of urinary oxalate actually de inc decreased by itself, which was also very interesting. Uh, because remember, these animals weren't actually placed on a high oxalate diet. This amount of oxalate is whatever is present um, in the um, um, control uh, diets in and of itself. What was even more exciting however, was the fact that when we looked at histology of the kidneys of the animals that were either on the regular diet or on the oxalate-rich diet, we actually found calcium oxalate crystals deposited uh, within, within the cortex uh, uh, of the kidneys, which is significant in that this is the first actual diet-induced model uh, of hyperoxaluria where the animals actually produce crystals. So this now obviously allows us to look at the impact of dietary supplementation on not only oxalate excretion or, 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 or uh, yeah, 
but also on the ability for crystals to to form. Um, so this now turned to what we call um, Sarah Hanstock is a graduate student in the in the lab, and she she calls it the buttocks study because obviously we're working with butyrate and oxalate and of course stool, so buttocks. Um, and so basically, this study uh, is a, an expansion of the um, one I just showed you, where we basically developed the diet-induced hyperoxaluria um, um, model. And basically, in this case, um, what happened is animals were were put on um, uh, the supplemented diet in addition to the high oxalate diet. So now we were able to really tease out and try and understand what inulin or tributyrin supplementation did to uh, the the um, oxalate absorption on a high in a hyperoxaluric state as well as a crystal formation. And then we of course perform different analyses to try and look at this. And so what we found that again, mice on the high oxalate diet consistently had the renal crystals and here's some very nice um, um, electron microscopy images, uh, H&E stains, as well as using polarized light microscopy to really be able to visualize um, uh, these crystals. And when you actually uh, you, uh, use um, uh, the energy dispersive x-ray capability of these microscopes, which basically allows you to look at elemental um, analysis, you can see that the crystals can say, contain carbon, they contain oxy oxygen, and calcium, they don't contain phosphorus, which basically combined means that these are in fact calcium oxalate deposits. The reason we look at phosphorus is because we wanna rule out that these are not uh, 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 magnesium ammonium phosphate, which of course uh, would be struvite. So, but what happens when you put these animals on the different diets? And so here are the animals, they're on the normal diet, so there's no oxalate given. Control animals, inulin supplemented, tributin supplemented, and as expected, we don't see any crystal deposition whatsoever. When you put these animals, so when you have these animals then with a, in combination with a high oxalate diet, the control animals form crystals, the inulin animals form crystals, and amazingly, none of the tributin supplemented animals formed crystals or had crystals. Uh, form in their kidneys, which is uh, super exciting. So again, this is a, just a graphical representation where we actually looked at the percent crystal surface area uh, within the kidneys of these animals. And again, you can quite clearly see that when they're placed in the high oxalate diet, you have uh, significantly uh, increased uh, crystal surface area uh, in the kidneys. Uh, uh, same was true when you placed them on the inulin plus oxalate diet. Um, but again, significantly reduced when you use tributyrin. So the next steps are basically to now use uh, HPLC and mass spec uh, methods that, that we've uh, developed uh, with, with Hans Adamat at, at, at the prostate center uh, to basically measure and quantify oxalate in the urine, the stool and serum to see how uh, those changed um, on the different treatments. Of course, analyze the microbiome and short chain fatty acid data to really try and understand what changes in both cause or associate it with the decreased um, uh, or the, the loss of crystal formation in the tributyrin uh, supplement in animals. And of course, we're also going to use uh, qPCR to basically investigate the expression of, of transporter proteins or as well as inflammatory markers and other factors to try and really get an idea of, of what the impact of increased butyrate is in the different steps of uh, stone formation uh, mechanism. Of course, the impact of all of this is, is quite uh, clear. I mean, overall limited studies have evaluated the influence of, of short chain fatty acids on kidney stone uh, in, in the context of kidney stone disease. And of course, our experiments will determine the mechanism of um, butyrate-related change in stone formation. And, and this will um, hopefully, or has significant potential to give rise to, to diet-induced uh, uh, treatment or preventative um, avenues 
uh, for patients uh, with recurring kidney stone uh, disease. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody who has been involved uh, in these studies. Of course, uh, I can't do any of this myself. There's, of course, my partner in crime, Ben Chu, um, Greg Tajian, who I also mentioned, um, Rizzi Wang and Janelle Healy, who's a, a dietitian um, at, at Children's Hospital, um, um, Damon Ferreira and Sarah Hanstock, who were the ones that the grad students that, that most did the work uh, on the mouse model, hyperoxaluria, Hans, um, Felipe and Kyung Wang, who assisted with, with uh, a lot of the microscopy and um, everybody else uh, in the lab. So thank you very much. And I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have.